women spend thousands of dollars looking good and on beauty products. And that's not like breaking news. In reality, they spend about twice as much as men in their lifetime on the same type of product. But what is not as mainstream is the emotional cost uh, to this journey of perfection that it might lead to, both in achieving it, uh, in getting there and maintaining it once it is achieved, and also in existing in our society once that end goal is really there. Why are is women's perception and drive towards looking a certain way so apparent today? And is this a universal aim? Or am I misreading it? And it's something that affects really just a fraction of the population. In reality it is that I know that I represent a very specific se uh, selection of society. I was both on TV, not for my looks, and won a beauty pageant, which I guess was for my looks. But then, I get, then again, I ended up working in finance, which leads to a um, love-hate relationship with my looks, uh, depending on their interpretation. We can add many filters here. Uh, but point blank, my background is as unique as it isn't. Um, how many young girls dream of becoming princesses growing up? And if I'm not able to fetch that exact statistic, uh, the one that I could fetch is uh, just a plain sample of adolescent girls and their dream occupation as they were growing up. In that, about 30% dream to become models. And the next second popular choice was acting, an acting career. So there we have the, the top two choices closely uh, of, of career um, selection, closely re related to looks. Uh, just as a point of comparison, less than 5% of those girls surveyed, uh, surveyed wanted to become an engineer. Thereby, um, that doesn't seem an odd as an aspiration of looking good, as we might think. What may be odd, I guess, or may be strange in some ways, is the uh, length of which some uh, would uh, go into achieving that aspiration. So I grew up in Bulgaria, a small country in Eastern Europe that had just ended its communist past. Um, and Western pop culture was just about entering the country um, and the local mediums of entertainment. Um, there was, however, a omnipresent a local social filter to a lot of concepts and societal understandings, including to the roles of men and women, and also to uh, the, uh, conce the conception and the ideal of the a beautiful woman uh, in society and what that entails. Uh, you can't be what you can't see. Uh, in many instances, the idea of that female beauty um, was a few, beauty figure was closely linked to um, the women that were accompanying, let's say, the guys who were running the 90s or in the early ages of democracy. Those were um, former models, national beauty queens that seemed to have to, to have it all based on their looks. But based on their looks was because back then I don't remember um, the uh, the substance or uh, their uh, their uh, personality being uh, as uh, turned into such mainstream as kind of how they looked. And I think that is one of the one of the issues here is that a lot of times in those instances society just tackles whatever they whatever we or they see rather than what's on the inside. So in my teens, uh, reality formats uh, rose uh, quickly to fame, uh, and in those formats, uh, there was usually in whatever whatever the series, there usually was this very pretty girl that became popular uh, because she was very often with surgical enhancements, with, but she became popular predominantly based on her looks, and ended up having this fairy tale life afterwards. Uh, very frequently, that fairy tale life was supplemented by someone. And I don't remember, I can, cannot recall an example of when this girl, this pretty girl example was uh, shown to have built this fairy tale herself, to build her, to have built her own castle. Maybe it happened, but it wasn't the narrative that was going to be um, bought uh, in primetime TV. So why this is problematic is because the Obviously, there has been an increased focus that media and society put on uh, women looking good and by thus also on um, the stereotype for girls to look good and on the pressure actually to look in a certain way. Um, is that, but is that really that big of a deal? You might ask, is it, isn't it just like a negligible detail? Well, yes and no. Uh, I think that if women are to present 50% of the world's population, and that is irrespective of which country uh, we are talking about, but uh, when one's opinion of the worlds are being formed, of course, it is very important who and where the influence of forming these opinions comes to. Um, so, of course, 
certain certain images uh, or certain uh, notions uh, of entertainment being plastered on primetime TV, that means that they are picked up in family, in school, around the kitchen table, in places where adolescents spend a lot of their time communicating and forming their beliefs further of the world. And what is the result is that guys and girls grow up with those certain social misconceptions about not only the world, but about their place within. And what this ends up uh, leading to is girls striving to perfection as an end goal. And in many cases, this goal is not achieved and that and what that means is that in one way it also limits them as to the potential that they may realize later on in life um because of this belief i think that uh, i think that there is very uh, wrong belief that a lot of uh, girls in society grow up with that being being beautiful or looking a certain way also means that you're ha just handed off uh, certain things in life um and also linked to that is that even if you do re achieve that goal or achieve that aspiration later on uh, a lot of times because of society's misconceptions but uh, the achievements of those so-called pretty girls are often disregarded and there is always this kind of second guessing and second crediting that happens so um it's just so much uh, why why this happens i don't know but it is a lot easier to box someone depending on the perception that you have of them or in the category that they fit in rather than to understand what is it out there on the on the substance and also the very uh, sad reality is that very frequently those girls by themselves us them uh, put themselves in the box that they are later on trying to escape from but where does this issue start and does it affect everyone in a, in the same way um so we said that media is certainly important uh, but what is even more important is that the environment that we grow up in as that is what perpetuates social culture um so is it really um, the question that we should be asking is, of course, yes, why uh, why are those girls or why are adolescents looking up to um, these entertainment models? And uh, why is it that this uh, information of access is so out there and it's available at hand? Yes, it is one question to ask. Why is it on the media and why is it on third party mediums? But the real question is, why is it that those 12 year olds have such a ease, ease of access to this information? And why isn't there a layer of guidance when they're just starting to interpret um, concepts that will define their lives for years uh, later on? Why isn't there this level of guidance existing earlier on? Perhaps a more unusual factor in my adolescence experience was that I got to live abroad at a very young age and living abroad also meant that the scope of information and the scope of, kind of news, uh, news overflow that I had access to was perhaps in an extent larger. So that also meant that I had access to teenage only magazines that were focusing on the lives of my favorite favorite celebrities what they wore um how they uh, what movies they made of course but also what they ate how they kept in shape and actually how they kept in shape was a lot of the part a lot of the focus in those uh, magazines um and also um this was available on demand it, again the access to this was very very easy uh, and the, the difference here might be also the depth in which it affected me because I was in a new country, um, I was in a new city, new environment, uh, just trying to uh, build a new life for myself. Um, and also, to be completely fair, I didn't have a lot of friends uh, back uh, back when I uh, back when I moved to the new country. So that means that I was also craving to create a place of belonging. And perhaps this mediums of entertainment and this uh, superficial uh, uh, superficial things that should be on the perhaps on the second uh, side but they um, started off helping me fill a gap that I guess I felt was missing but what this ended up happening is that the my I guess twisted image that I had of good looks and roles of women in society just married to this concept of dream body and dieting that I started to see growing up um, and because I had access to more, also that means having more access to fashion brands, having more access to uh, designer brands, this uh, whole just uh, created, um, created a, a wave of superficial things that started making me happy. And the more you get, the more you want. So you'd see that this parallel um, the, of how we are using supplementary things to fill gaps that we uh, that we feel emotionally is just actually very apparent and perhaps you could relate it in a later part of my talk. 
But what changed in any case, what changed when I returned to Bulgaria was that the image of those pretty girls that we uh, spoke about earlier was not only accessible to me via third party mediums on TV or on magazines or newspapers, but it, it just very much became part of my day to day. Uh, we ended up um, hanging out in the same crowd. We ended up being in the same social circle, eating by the same table. And if you remember late earlier when I said that media is important, but it's actually the environment that perpetuates our social norms and our understanding of the world. And I might have grown up with those images of picture perfect models and uh, girls who are dieting or notions of dieting or whatever. But it wasn't until I actually was physically sitting with those type, those type of girls that actually those, they, them later on became us. Uh, but it is, when I actively started to pursue the uh, pursue the dream, let's say, of becoming uh, of becoming like them, uh, and that's when the idea of drastically changing my body uh, came to fruition. Um, I actually started looking back uh, for the purpose of this talk, trying to understand when is it that this uh, that this started and when. It, it is a two-sided. Um, it is a two-sided way in which I strive to change my body, um, adding what I thought was missing, and I guess uh, restricting or uh, removing what I thought it was uh, was of excess. Um, and it actually uh, led me to uh, understand that it was via very naive episodes of me <laughs> growing up uh, that were um, that I will share uh, later on, but. They were related to uh, social interactions and to social occasions. And um, it took me a little bit of time, or a little bit of reflection to just see what is the level of impact that I, they had on me and my um, choices for my body and I guess my place in the world for, uh, for years to come. But um, both actually relate to this first guy that uh, I was dating and um, it was, uh, I guess, in some, in some respect, um, you might say um, the 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 first boyfriend or, or the first love that I had but in any case um in one of the first uh, uh, occasions that I just mentioned about adding something that I thought was missing it was around an episode that a friend of his had a birthday and it, we were uh, I was about to meet his his friend both and also his social circle for the first time and uh, and around this social gathering around the table there was this really pretty girl who was um, actually a couple of months older than me um, but uh, she was um, she was gorgeous she was flawless she had just gone uh, undergone a breast augmentation procedure and uh, she just really looked like a, a living uh, like a living doll um, if I was pretty back then I guess she was just dro dropped that gorgeous uh, and um, I realized that that's when it hit me because I liked I liked her I wanted to be like her I wanted to understand more about um, kind of what she did she was just very interesting to me and I also remember that uh, even if everyone was just being very friendly and very nice to me there was just this sense of her sending out that I um, that I do uh, remember um, and what I failed to see back then, to be completely honest, was that she was uh, very modest in her behavior. She didn't drink. She uh, had her back hunched for most of the night. She left very early. Um, and later on, um, I think that uh, I found out that she previously had won this uh, Prettiest Girl competition title that happens in a lot of cities in Bulgaria, it's this kind of nightclub competition. So, But it, also, I understood that her parents were long divorced. So there were two paradoxes here, uh, if you think about it all at once. So firstly, obviously, once once you stand out, there is a very difficult way that you start to fit back in, I guess, again. Um, and also uh, about her breast augmentation procedure, when I was asking myself, I guess, the question is, how is it that she already had it? How is it that she already experienced that? What I, what I and society, we should be asking is that why did she even have access to this in the first place at age sub-18? Um, we shouldn't, uh, it's very easy that uh, we label girls a certain way or blame her or whoever or her or me or uh, other uh, or others for setting the wrong example. But before we, th we do that, I think it's very important for us to uh, understand and to try to, and to try to emphasize with why was it that according to her, this was the right example to begin with. Um, and the other episode was that flash news, again, related to the same person uh, that I just mentioned, but another friend of his was um, in a, again, social environment, but another friend of his was uh, this girl who had a very model-like physique. Uh, she was super skinny, very pretty. Um, she was wearing, I remember, a baggy, a baggy top, and she made it look cool, which I was very impressed with. Um, and also, she uh, seemed that she knew everyone in the place that we were at. Everyone was nice to her. 
guys wanted to be just her friend and I just thought that she had this very uh, interesting aura um, around her but also taking pictures together it was very very clear that she was super uh, I was I was slim but she was very very skinny and uh, this is I guess uh in, uh, in a very twisted way, but it made me want to be like her and being like her in my eyes um, looked as uh, in the, looked into the uh, into the body weight and in the body department. And um, so uh, I think that there are there are a couple of things to unbundle here. Um, she was also not dating uh, anyone who was random, so that also meant a uh, link to the to the uh, link that I previously meant, uh, mentioned about beautiful girl, successful guy. But what I of course didn't see from our first encounter, and it only took me a couple of uh, uh, interactions with her, uh, and even to this day to understand that she was actually a very kind person. She loved animals. She cared about social causes. Of course, this is not things that you can see at first sight, and I think this is. A Again, how we as a society can sometimes uh, create the wrong misconceptions and just focus on the very superficial elements uh, to begin with, which um, uh, which is quite problematic. Um, so I think uh, to be uh, to be fair, those how those two uh, episodes translated into my own uh, living experience was that of course, even though um, even though I had uh, heard on the second part about uh, body, lo uh, body wall and loss and image, even though I had heard those concepts before in uh, movies or in TV shows, uh, for example, who doesn't remember one of the, I think it's one of the uh, most evident pop culture examples where um, a group of four girls um, uh, becomes as uh, kind of most popular girls in the school and then once one of them gains weight and she's uh, excluded from the cool girls table. But as I said, it was only after looking seeing those examples and experiencing them firsthand uh, that I uh, actively started to um, take steps to um, to implement those uh, um, role, role models or uh, traits that I saw uh, into into my day to day. Uh, so uh, what ended up is that I lost about five to seven kilos over the uh, course of three months. Uh, so when you are when you weigh about 52 kilos, that's a lot. So it was over the course of a summer. Uh, and uh, I can, of course, blame it that it was uh, summer and heat uh, naturally prevents you from eating too much. But uh, to be completely fair, it wasn't it wasn't a healthy it wasn't a hundred percent healthy um, way of getting to that weight. Uh, and also, what uh, was really problematic is that after I returned uh, after the summer of uh, twelve, so before before actually twelfth grade, um, my classmates were thrilled to see me in this uh, in this shape and this was also a supplementary example that this indeed was the top shape and also um, uh, encouraged me to keep it up. Uh, it also raised for myself the question of uh, well how did I how did I look like <laughs> before was it really that big of a difference I guess I, I guess it really was and it couldn't be otherwise because the um, uh, the regime that I started doing was uh, very um, restrictive when it came to food so it, um, just to give you an example, and I don't want anyone copying it, but one of the things was uh, no food or just water after 6 p.m. So you can understand how, and of course, also cutting certain groups of foods all together, um, like wheat, fried food, um, different examples. But what this, um, why this is uh, an issue is that also this kind of rules, self-imposed rules of no food after 6 p.m., this also relates to how you're going to go about uh, social uh, interactions, uh, social occasions. So going for dinner when you cannot eat dinner is also not very, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, not something that you can keep up for a long time without it being uh, accepted in the wrong way, which it totally, it, it totally should, to be completely fair. But um, what I mean by all this and why I'm sharing this as an example is that extremes are never good and when it's something uh, when it's about something as precious as the human body adding in the wrong fuel or no fuel at all um, is just calling for an imminent clash um, so just as a side note 95 percent of people experiencing food related diseases are actually in that very fragile age of 20, 12 to 25 um, and if you think about, if you think that this is a, an issue that is unique and it affects just a very, very tiny proportion of the population, um, it actually isn't because it's interesting to note that when uh, weight loss in time and the uh, ideal female weight has been drastically decreasing since the mid 21st century, the actual weight of women has been increasing for the same time period. Um, so there is a little bit of a disparity in what we are seeing um, in the media and what we are seeing as that products being told and actually how um, natural uh, how natural progression um, 
comes uh, comes about. And I'm telling you this from the distance of time as if I knew it long before, but the reality is that I didn't. Um, and I had no idea how bad those patterns that I was adopting were. Um, those uh, unhealthy patterns that I had with food, actually I realized um, kind of intensified once I had relationship problems, which also made me to realize and reflect back that I guess in my head, uh, in my uh, what what was true is that the notion of looking a certain way also equaled with feeling loved, um, and my relationship with food also drastically improved when I was in that uh, in that uh, uh, stable uh, relationship. Um, so what broke the loop actually was paradoxically reaching that ideal envisioned. So I went down my own path of learning life experiences, drama and trauma, uh, and understood that beauty can neither be an end goal nor it can be a means to an end. Um, I became and retired from my trophy wife girlfriend title before the age of 23. Um, I won a national beauty pageant only to have my former boss, who, mind you, was uh, in, uh, in the uh, news channel that I worked, call me up to say that I could either do serious news or you know, switch over, where the looks didn't matter, or switch over to casual uh, lifestyle news if I wanted people to have this perception of this perception of me, right? Um, so um, I also uh, started to see those type of good uh, good looks, I guess, was, were not perceived by everyone with the same connotation. Um, I also got breast implants when I was age 22, uh, and a couple of months later, my engagement broke off. Uh, so there wasn't any link. Even if I thought that there was a link between looking good and feeling love, it just very quickly evaporated. Um, and the sad, uh, the sad part is that I fell into this uh, pretty girl trap pattern that we discussed all along. And looking that part uh, overtook a lot more uh, aspects of my life than I wish it did. And to date, I cannot tell you of some sort of major accomplishment that I have done uh, during my university time, other than yeah, keeping my grades up and also keeping my relationship stable. Uh, and of course, we all know that there are people who are building a billion dollar companies from their dormitories. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, I had the opportunity, perhaps studying in one of the largest cities, um, uh, studying, uh, studying in one of the largest cities uh, in uh, in the world uh, and access to a lot, a lot of opportunities. And I'm not sure that I had uh, quite the grasp to capture them. So why I'm sharing all this uh, is because I wish that girls my age actually have a different um, perception and have a different uh, opinion and have also a different level of knowledge uh, when they are able to make their choices earlier so that you can learn from other people's mistakes and not from your own. Um, and maybe times are indeed different. Maybe maybe young girls today are bolder, better, with bigger dreams. Uh, and I keep meeting those outlier examples, actually, such as very recently a former international model turned scientist who is building an AI tool uh, to support former uh, fellow models and also creatives in uh, not signing contracts that might be um, harmful to them. I don't know. But what I do know is that a, a recent uh, very recently, a very popular Bulgarian celebrity girl, known for her pretty girl icon image, launched an autobiography book, and it got uh, and it became a sellout uh, even before it hit the newsstands. What that leads me to believe is that uh, image um, girls have of how they should look uh, hasn't evaporated, and there's just as much of a demand as there was when I was growing up. Um, and uh, back to this girl, she actually, even though she has done a hundred things in business and has launched a label and participated in campaigns and um, whatever she does, she would be categorized as this pretty girl and her actions uh, ridiculed. Um, and it's actually a little bit, uh, and it's actually, it, it, it is um, a little bit sad because uh, little did society knows that she has been footing her own bill for the longest of time rather than uh, looking up to someone else. So um, what, with that, I would like to leave everyone with, uh, with the message of this talk is that um, there, are, there were a couple of messages intertwined, but one of it is that we, um, we as a society, what we can do is to become more tolerant and to understand, uh, firstly, to be empathetic to, uh, to everyone around us, but also to understand that labeling uh, people is not good and to understand what is uh, out there beneath the label. 
Um, what we can do is be kind, of course, uh, and try to read the book before we judge the cover. Um, and we also, um, I think it would be really great if we are to uh, work on freeing ourselves from our own biases. Um, the most beautiful girl in the room can also be the most insecure. And similarly, she might also have the most substance to add to the table, only if we let her.